Hello pandas and welcome to the scrap motor episode. If you want to make money scrapping an electric motor for copper and aluminum, well you clicked well because we are going to crack these things right open and reveal their secrets. Electric motors, big and small, they are everywhere. They make things go and they're full of copper, except the aluminum ones. If you want something pushed or lifted and you don't want to do it yourself, electric motors. More to the point, if your singular goal is the copper inside because you're a goblin and you like shiny things, copper. then skip ahead to the part where we crack them open and find out how much is in the big ones and the small ones and how long it takes. Myself, I don't save the copper. I sell it for cash money. And if that is the goal, we could be missing out on a lot of it if we jumped straight to the smashing. See, motors are expensive and worth surprisingly little as scrap. So if you've got your hands on a good one, selling it as a working unit is way better. This 10 horsepower one here. Nope. Uh, sells for 1300 bucks brand new. And it's still worth a couple hundred dollars used if it works. So how do we know if it works? Just plug it in, right? Yes. But actually, no. Let me explain. And I have a degree in motorology from the University of Wikipedia, so I'm basically an expert. Now, motors are pretty simple, but they don't just work and not work. They degrade over time, and with it, their lifespan and their value degrades. Let's look. So you've got the outside and the inside. The inside is basically a magnetic lump surrounded by lots of copper wire wrapped around and around and around. See, a long time ago, a series of sorcerers eventually learned that if you force lightning through a long enough tube, it'll convince any nearby magnets to follow along. And if you do that in a circle, it'll cause them to spin. So this works great, but the problem is lightning needs very clear directions or it gets everywhere and it makes a mess. So the tubes are copper wire, which is insulated to keep the lightning going in the right direction. But it gets hot and then it cools down again and then it gets hot again and then it cools down again. And eventually the insulation starts to get weak and cracks and then the lightning escapes. And if it gets bad enough, then it lights on fire in what is known as a critical failure. And of course the magnets just want to do whatever their cool buddy lightning is doing, but if it's going all over the place, then they get confused and don't spin the rod so good. Fortunately, there are a few simple tests we can do to test for the lightning escaping, AKA a short. Now, of course, there are a lot of tests you can do to precisely determine the health of an electric motor, but we can't test for the resistance of the insulation without a specialized tool that puts a lot of electricity lightning into the thing. Uh, but we do have some simple tests that we can do with some fairly simple tools. The first one, just spin the rod, make sure it's not seized up and the bearing isn't all worn out. Then with a multimeter set to ohms, crack open the connection panel so we can see if there is any shorts to ground. Check the connection for each phase to ground and it should read infinite. If you get zero or any other number, then there's a short to ground. Then test each pair of phases for resistance. They should all be the same, anywhere from 0.3 to 2 ohms. Ideally, 0.8, if you get a zero, then you have a short. And if you have anything above 2 ohms, then you have an open circuit. If it passes all of these tests, it's probably good. And you can go ahead and plug it in just to see it running before you sell it for a lot more than scrap value. Unfortunately, you may not be able to because some require an inverter just to get enough power to turn on, like this one, a 575 volt motor. If it doesn't pass these tests, then you probably can't sell it until you repair it, which might still be worth doing depending. Rewinding a motor is like 500 bucks, so that doesn't leave much room for profit. But sometimes it might just need new leads attached somewhere or uh, the windings dipped to refresh the insulation, and a shop could do that much cheaper. Now, of course, this is just super simplified and as quick as possible. There are lots of other tests to determine the overall health of a motor. Uh, with something like these, though, a little, you know, 120 volt, it's as simple as that. You just spin the thing and make sure it's free and the bearing isn't making noise. And then you can just wire it in and see if it turns on. One final point, though, the bigger a motor is, the harder it's going to be to sell. A little, like, quarter horse, one eighth horse, those sorts of things might fit a whole bunch of different tools or even better if it came out of an appliance and you know what appliance it is. Now, after confirming that the unit is absolutely definitely never getting put back in service, let's see if they're worth taking apart. 
The guy at the scrapyard told me that they definitely are not, but they're always after me Lucky Charms, so I don't trust him for a minute. Let's have a look. Now I've got three main types that I want to look at. Anything smaller than these three, don't even ask. There's no way it's worth it. Unless it's one of those microwave transformers that you can crack open just with a hammer and then it's like, boom, done. Now we'll try and do this as quickly as possible because I'm trying to just stick to the data, but I do have a few notes on each one. So this is out of that dishwasher. It's got an aluminum housing and the video I saw was by Moose Scrapper. That guy is the OG. He's been scrapping since before. It was cool. Based on what I saw him doing, it looked like it was pretty finicky to clean all the aluminum, but we'll just see uh, what the yield is. That's a real nice looking lump, but remember we mentioned aluminum? We want to be sure. And unfortunately, this one is aluminum windings. Sometimes they alternate. Yeah. So see there? The small one is showing a copper color and the bigger, thicker ones are all aluminum. So even in the 70s, they were starting to get cheap. So for this one, we're just gonna stop there because otherwise we would get 50 bucks a ton for the steel. But in this form, we'll get eight to 15 cents a pound for the motor. Next one is this guy, the sort that uh, lots of tools have to make them go. And it has a steel casing around the outside. I've seen, um, I think the best video I saw was Scrap Man Industries. He was ripping through these things like nothing, but that's because he had a plasma cutter. So these inside bits, they are in there quite firm. I'm going to use a block to keep it from walking away. Now that's what we wanted. Yes, Mom, we're wearing eye protection. Now this doesn't quite fit in my tiny little vise, so we're just going to have to do it this way. I should probably save that. Yeah, that'll add up. Now we can use the vise. Harder than you think. Okay, so you may be able to tell, um, I had some difficulty getting all of that out. Anyone else who's done this always seems to get it out in a nice, clean lump. That was not my experience. All right, now this one. This should be fun. Ooh. Copper check. Yes. Now I checked out a bunch of other people's videos on how to crack these things open and I think the one who's got it figured out is Canadian Treasure Hunter. He just used a, a big maul to like crack right into it and split it apart and it, it took him seconds. Uh, I unfortunately don't have a maul. Uh, so I am going to try it with a four pound hand sledge. The problem with these is that uh, maybe some of them are aluminum but this one is not. Uh, this one is cast iron, which is brittle, um, but we'll just see. Hopefully it's really brittle. Yeah, this is not easy. I tell you what. It's very thick, but maybe if we start it by sort of scoring the edge. Yeah, I mean, I think that's worked. That is a beautiful chunk of copper, though. Hmm. 
That's it. That's it. Okay, I need to clean this mess up, but I wanted to give you guys some quick notes on how I eventually managed to extract everything from here. First thing, I thought Canadian Treasure Hunter was being silly uh, using a reciprocating saw instead of one of these to cut through here, but the thing is you just don't have enough reach with the blade on the angle grinder, so the reciprocating saw was necessary, which meant a lot of loss of tiny little flakes of copper. The second thing, it is so much material bound so tightly together and then coated in glue. These are, you can't really just force them up one at a time because they have the tension of all of the rest of them uh, holding them all in place. So what I eventually ended up doing these little V-shaped cards of insulation, I found I could take the screwdriver and just like some of them would move and I, I could tap them through. Then I ended up pulling out copper strands one at a time to reduce the amount that was inside each of those channels. And I took the reciprocating saw again to chop through separating each hemisphere. And then I was able to get enough motion that uh, with a combination of the screwdriver, um, levering them out one at a time, and then eventually um, this bar with the fingers um, tapping them out, I eventually got them out. Uh, it took me an extremely long time. Now I'm gonna clean this up and pull out the scale so we can all have a look at the numbers, and then we'll be back with a few final thoughts. All right, well, that's the data. What do we make of that? Honestly, I was expecting to come away from this convinced this was a huge waste of time. I actually did believe the guy at the scrapyard, but of course it's a waste of time if it's not actually copper, so check and make sure they're aluminum windings. And if it's any smaller than the three that we looked at, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a waste of time too. But I was actually kind of surprised at uh, the blue one, the first one that we completely got all the windings out of. Now, it did take about an hour and a half of fiddling to get all the copper windings out of there, but it was about $7. I haven't actually done the math yet. I'm, all I've done is rough estimations, but you'll have seen the math. So my guess is it was about $7 worth of copper. Now at that rate, it's definitely not worth it. But if you could process more than two of these in an hour, then I would say that is worth it. Uh, so, not bad. Now, the big one on the other hand, I was pretty sure there was no way that was going to be worth it because it was a, a really big job. But, we do have a giant bag of number two copper. And remember, it's number two because of the insulation that we talked about. So there's really no reason to try and clean off all the paper and string. It's not going to make it any better than number two. So, you can just leave that. After separating that motor, it went from less than $20 as a complete unit scrap value to more than $60. So this is, uh, it depends a lot on the price that you've got available, but right now I'm getting $275 at one place and $3 a pound at another place. So this is like a $60 bag of copper. And it's hard to argue with that. I was fully prepared to tell people it's a huge waste of time and not to do it, but I can't really do that because I really didn't enjoy uh, taking apart that motor. There were parts of it that were fun, but it was a huge job. That is like five hours. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed to admit that, but it's the truth. If you could find a way to get through one of those in an hour-ish, it would absolutely be worth it. If I find a motor that size again, I probably will try and scrap it because I want to see how much faster I can get now that I know where I was losing all of my time. And I think the most important thing would be to separate the two different hemispheres, but maybe even more than that. I would probably cut them into quarters because that'll make it a lot easier. You'll just have less uh, surface area holding everything in there. Going about things that way, I could realistically see getting it done in less than an hour. So are electric motors worth scrapping? Unfortunately, yes. And I say unfortunately because it was pretty difficult and there were times when I, I, I may or may not have cried a little on that big one. And I definitely smashed up my thumb. So if you're going to break motors down, 
the bigger the better. And definitely save them up and do them all in one session. So that way you'll be able to identify different habits that can speed you up and put them in practice right away. Well, I'm glad we explored this and thank you for checking it out. Hit the like button for the best motor scrapping video on YouTube. I personally probably won't scrap any more of these smaller ones. I will keep grabbing them because it's an easy one to two dollars and you don't have to do anything to get that money. Plus, if what you're really after is copper, there are much more efficient, easier ways to put a pile of it together. And I'll be putting a video together, so subscribe if you want to know more about that. Leave it better than you found it. Keep doing the thing.